God, thank you so much for a new day, for new mercies, another opportunity on this Sunday to be reminded of your kindness to us, to be reminded of who we are, to be reminded how our thoughts renewed about the truth. God, you intend this for the godliness of your people. You intend for us to accurately reflect your own holiness. And so in all the ways that are possible, I pray that you would cause us to do just that. Use this message as a, uh, another stepping stone to further Christ likeness. And God, if you would be so kind to use us to that end, we would uh, glorify you and, and worship your holy name uh, with all that's in us. Pray that that would be our heartbeat this morning, that you would make me clear, make the listeners attentive, uh, convict, and give clarity where we must have it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Mr. Harry Phillips, also known as Henry Phillips, that name may not mean uh, much to some of you, but Harry Phillips is an unfortunately excellent example of what we're going to be discussing this morning. Harry Phillips is a great example of rank hypocrisy. He was born into great wealth in England in the 1500s. At one point, Phillips was entrusted with a large sum of money by his parents to pay off a debt, and he traveled to London to pay this debt, but upon arriving in the city, ended up gambling it all away entirely. At some point, now away from his family, bordering on abject poverty, Phillips met someone who had long been seeking a wanted man who had been deemed essentially an enemy of the state and of the Pope. Henry Phillips saw in this an opportunity to gain wealth once again, and so he put his powers of persuasion, his intellect, his craftiness, all of these things to use, and he convinced his new acquaintance that he could deliver this wanted man into their custody. Henry Phillips saw in this uh, an opportunity for great wealth. And so, eventually, he made his way to Antwerp, which is about a three days walk. And after much seeking, he found his prey. He made friends with this wanted man, even to the point that he had gained his trust so thoroughly that this man took him in as a roommate. Uh, he began, they began living together uh, because he loved Henry Phillips so much and appreciated his friendship so greatly that they even lived together. Here's what one writer records about what eventually became this great betrayal. Here is how it happened. The creature was exceedingly fond of money. He had received a great deal from the priests in, in England for the payment of his mission. But he thought it would be only right to plunder his victim before giving him up to death. Finding Tyndale at home, he said to him after few compliments, I must tell you my misfortune. This morning I lost my purse between here and Mechlin, and I am penniless. Could you lend me some money? Tyndale, that is William Tyndale, simple and inexperienced in the tricks of the world, went to fetch the required sum and lent him 40 shillings. The delighted Phillips put the money carefully in his pocket and then thought only of betraying his kind-hearted friend. Well, Master Tyndale, he said, we are going to dine together. No, replied Tyndale, I am going to dine out today. Come along with me. I will answer for it 
that you will be welcome. Philip's joyfully consented. Promptitude of execution was one element of success in his joyfully or in his business. The two friends prepared to start. The alley behind which they had to go out was so narrow that two persons could not walk abreast. Finally, Ortendale, wishing to do the honors to Philip, desired him to go first. I will never consent, replied the latter, pretending to be very polite. I know the respect due to you. It is for you to lead the way. Thus, Tyndale, who was of moderate height, went first, while Phillips, who was very tall, came behind him. He had placed two agents at the entrance who were sitting at each side of the valley. Hearing footsteps, they looked up and saw the innocent Tyndale approaching them without suspicion and over his head, or over his shoulders, the head of Phillips. He was a lamb led to slaughter by the man who was about to sell him. The officers of justice, frequently so hard-hearted, experienced feelings of compassion at the sight. But the traitor, raising himself behind the reformer, who was about to enter the street, placed his forefinger over Tyndale's head according to the signal which he had agreed upon and gave the men a significant look as if to say, this is he. The men at once laid hands upon Tyndale, who in his holy simplicity did not at first understand what they intended doing. He found out. For they ordered him to move on, the officers following him, and he was thus taken before the imperial prosecutor. This is how the capture of William Tyndale occurred, at least by the reconstruction of one church historian, Merle Dubinier. You can see the hypocrisy uh, that happened, uh, that was carried out by Harry Phillips. William Tyndale, by the way, was um, almost single-handedly the reason that you have the Bibles you hold in your lap, on your device. Uh, He sought to translate the Bible at great cost to himself, uh, always away from home, persecuted, uncomfortable, never at rest, always looking over his shoulder. This was uh, something of his final mistake in being kind in in these ways and entrusting uh, himself to this treacherous man. This kind of treachery, this kind of rank hypocrisy is present in every human heart. You might hear a story like that and think, well, I would never commit that kind of treachery, but at least the capacity to practice that kind of betrayal, that kind of deception and double-mindedness is possible for all men to some degree or other. In fact, hypocrisy, which is to act a part, to play a part, to live in a pretended fashion is all hypocrisy is, that comes as naturally to man as truth suppression. Hypocrisy is as familiar to us, as easy for us, as truth suppression. And let me just remind you what exactly that is. If you go to Romans 1, you can see from the pen of Paul why God is so furious with all mankind why his wrath is being revealed from heaven. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, again, Paul says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This is why Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel why that gospel is God's power to save everyone who will believe, and in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. 
faith. It's for this very reason. First, because God's wrath is being revealed against the, unright- the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do this, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And this has been happening since the creation of the world when he's been revealing his attributes in the very things that have been made. This is natural to us. Verse 25 says, For they, these men who know the truth about God, but instead choose to suppress the truth about God, they exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is idolatry. This is false worship. This is deception. This is a choice to worship what is unworthy instead of what is infinitely worthy. This is a lot of things. But among those things that this is, that's being described here, is also hypocrisy. To know something that is true and instead choose to live contrary to it, uh, to act as if the truth is not known, to live in a pretended way. Uh, the, The picture is that of an actor carrying out theater for show. So that what can be seen externally is not actually what's going on inside. The worship being carried out as genuine, finding other things worthy of worship, is in itself an act of hypocrisy because those who are worshiping what they know is not worthy, who are pretending that these things are worthy of worship, actually, we've already read, know the truth. God has made the truth evident within them. This is hypocrisy. It's insincerity. It's a lack of earnestness. It's not genuine. It's dishonest. This is hypocrisy. And so we would do well to remember this morning that all of us is prone to this very practice, even as believers to fall back into Practicing hypocrisy. To know the truth and pretend as if we don't. This morning, what I want to give us is nine thoughts for crucifying hypocrisy. We must put hypocrisy to death. If we don't, if we fail to put hypocrisy to death, then it will be at the cost of our own souls. And so this morning, here are nine thoughts for crucifying hypocrisy. The first is this, repentance is rare. Repentance is rare. If we know that repentance is rare, rare, this will help guard us from living in a pretended way. Go to Matthew chapter 7. This point is made well by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, at wit, in which, in this sermon, he addresses numerous times the very practice of hypocrisy. All of chapter 6, before we get to what he what he ends up saying in chapter 7. Just note, at the beginning of chapter 6, he gives a warning. Verse 1, beware. That's warning language. Beware of what? Well, it's specifically practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. What he's taking aim at at this point in the Sermon on the Mount, as he seeks to Describe for this Old New Testament audience as he seeks to describe genuine righteousness that characterizes kingdom citizens, he warns them against hypocrisy, practicing righteousness before men to be noticed by them. 
Here we'll get to uh, another thought that will help cure us of hypocrisy. But just notice the rest of verse 1. Otherwise, you have your reward, or no reward, excuse me. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. There he's drawing a contrast and where, or for people who are tempted to practice righteousness with man primarily in their thoughts, he reminds them of a greater reality than the men that they see. It's the one who is unseen, who is in heaven, God the Father. And then he goes on to describe practicing genuine righteousness that's noticed by God the Father himself. That includes not sounding a trumpet, verse 2, as the hypocrites, so that they could be honored by men. But it includes giving to the poor and not letting your left hand know what your right is doing. The one who sees in secret would reward what's done in secret. This includes praying in such a way that doesn't impress people. That's what hypocrites do. But praying in secret, verse 6. He tells them how to pray. This includes verse 16, fasting, not like hypocrites. But fasting in such a way that God who sees in secret and who is in secret, verse 18, would reward what's done in secret. Where this eventually goes, Jesus talks about the rarity of this kind of sincerity that he's been describing. And he does that in verse 13 of chapter 7. Just note what he says. He gives these instructions, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Repentance is rare. Conversion is rare. The path on which those travel who are saved, who do repent, who practice a genuine, sincere righteousness and who put off hypocrisy, is a narrow one. The gate's narrow, the way is narrow. By contrast, broad is the gate and the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. With with just those couple of verses, Jesus describes the rarity of the one who eventually inherits eternal life, who eventually makes it into the kingdom, even whose life currently looks like what characterizes the life of kingdom citizens. Just consider as you think about the rarity of repentance For almost all of human history, what has been the message of God to man? The Old Testament prophets, their message was repent to a nation of rebellious people. Repent. That was Israel. That was their message to Israel. That was their message at many times to pagan nations, thinking of Jonah and Nineveh, Daniel and the various kingdoms that he was in. Their message to people and nations was repent. Consider John the Baptist. John came after all of the Old Testament prophets as the last Old Testament prophet. What was his message? Repent. Think about Jesus' message. Mark 1.15, the kingdom is at hand, repent. Repent. And believe the gospel. Jesus' message was repentance. The apostles, thinking of Acts 2 and 3, their message was no different. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance was their message. 
and even the church in the church age. What was the church's message? What is our message still? Wrath is coming. Repent. If repentance wasn't so rare, it wouldn't be required in every generation of men. Repentance is rare. This thought encourages us to pursue sincerity, to crucify hypocrisy. The one who realizes, recognizes the rarity of repentance will treat it like the precious treasure that it is. He will lay hold of repentance at all costs. Whatever sin still is lingering in your life, perhaps, whatever besetting sin you may still have, if you recognize the rarity of repentance, that there are few who find it, then no cost will be too great for you to forsake that sin and lay hold of sincerity to crucify hypocrisy, whatever it takes. Another thought that's helpful to crucifying hypocrisy is that God sees the heart. God sees the heart. Go to Proverbs chapter 16. So I want to just make this statement. God sees the heart. This is helpful, a helpful thought to call to mind, to put to death hypocrisy that might still be a temptation, whatever duplicitousness still lingers in us. Consider Proverbs 16, 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. But Yahweh weighs the heart, or weighs the spirit, rather. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but Yahweh weighs the spirit. Look at 22, or 21 verse 2 in Proverbs. Proverbs 21, 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but Yahweh weighs the heart. This sort of takes the focus even off of what our own impression of self might be. Every man can justify himself. That's not unique. To find no fault in the thoughts you think, in the things you do, to deem your own motives pure and upright, that's common to all men. Unbelievers do that. So it's better to be reminded of, regardless of what you think about your own ways, about your own motives, what's wise is to remember that Yahweh weighs the heart. Flip back to 15.1 in Proverbs. We'll look at a couple more. Proverbs 15.11, rather. Not 15.1, 15.11. Sheol and Abaddon lie open before Yahweh. That's the grave and the underworld. They lie open before Yahweh. How much more the hearts of the children of man? Those things that can't be seen, what's under the ground where people are buried, and what's perhaps even underneath that, the place where dead souls are kept, even those things are not a mystery to God. They lie open. Everything that takes place, everything that is there, he sees with perfect clarity. So how much more living people walking around, still having the breath of life in them, are, are their hearts open to God? The heart, the place where everything about you comes from which everything about you comes your thoughts your desires your motives your convictions and beliefs your words originate here this lies open to god and it's a how much more the hearts of the children of man call that to mind god knows your heart even if it were possible 
to the sea to, to the day that you die, every person alive, it would not matter at the moment that you die. God knows your motive. And so if you were able to live a hundred plus years with false motives, know that God will unmask them in due time. One more proverb, 24, verse 11. Chapter 24, verse 11 and 12. This is an encouragement to put off hypocrisy. Solomon gives this instruction. <clears throat> Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. It's a, an injunction to pass on wisdom, to be a restraining influence in those who would kill themselves by their own foolishness. Verse 12, if you say, behold, we did not know this. Well, does he not, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Saying, I didn't know. Not going, having a, a good excuse to not go to the aid of others. To not go be that restraining influence in the lives of others who need to be held back. It doesn't matter before God if it sounds like you have a good excuse. Maybe you see someone in the church with a particular weakness and you think, ah, oh, that's somebody else's job to counsel them. Or, yeah, it's there, but that would be a really hard conversation. I'm just not ready for it. That's my excuse. And so weeks become months, maybe years, and you never step into that person's life because I'm not ready for it. Well, the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord perceives it. He knows the excuse before you make it. He's weighing the heart. He's weighing the soul. And will repay man according to his work. So God sees the heart. Just flip over one, one passage in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians. Jacob, this should be an outline uh, in pro presenter, by the way. If you've got the rest of it up, don't worry about it. But... 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, this was motivation for Paul in ministry, recognizing that God sees the heart. This was actually motivation for him to carry out everything he did in ministry in a blameless way. Didn't matter to him if he could fool the Thessalonians to whom he was ministering. Paul knew better. And so he didn't seek to deceive them, but to be upright before the Lord. Look at verse 1 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. He's describing hypocrisy. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we see glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But we proved to be what? Gentle among you 
as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you, believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Numerous times he can tell the Thessalonians, you know, you know, you know. Why? Because first and foremost, they weren't in view. God was in view. The God who sees the motives, who sees the heart. And so he can say with a pure conscience, a clean conscience to the Thessalonians, you know this was the case because God was witnessing that this was the case. The person who's living uprightly before God knows that he's living uprightly before men. And so crucifying hypocrisy involves this thought that God sees the heart. And it also includes the opposite of that. Number three, I see in part. As surely as God sees the heart, we only see in part. First Corinthians, uh, Paul says this, First Corinthians chapter four. Again, commenting something similar to the Corinthians, he talks about the way that he carried out his ministry. It was in a faithful way. That's primarily what was on Paul's mind, not man, but God. And so he carried out ministry duties in a way that was trustworthy. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Let a man regard us in this manner as slaves of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. So notice that he's recognizing, he's commenting that he's been entrusted with the gospel by God. He's a slave of Christ, a steward of the mysteries of God. So primarily, again, in his mind is not man, the people to whom he's ministering, as much as he loves them, as much as he enjoys serving them, primarily in his mind is God's authority, his accountability to God himself, not to the people being served. And so with that in mind, he can say it's his aim to be found trustworthy. That's his job as one who's been entrusted with the mysteries of God. Verse 3, but to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. There the authority of God, the Lord, it's, it's the authority of Christ who is the Lord that's primarily on his mind. And so in con contrast, in comparison, what does he think about people judging him? That's nothing. That's an afterthought. That's, that hardly crosses my mind because I'm so full of a view of the Lord, of the authority of God. This is, again, as we talked about last week in diagnosing sin, you have theology embedded in the passages that urge, that spur us on to holiness. Here we're getting the same thing. Paul's theology is, is just pouring forth from the pages to tell us what thoughts were primarily on his mind. This is how Paul put a fear of man to death. Being examined by people became a very small thing in his mind because he was most mindful of the Lord. And similarly, if we are most mindful of the Lord, 
then it will be a very small thing to be judged by others and even ourselves. Paul recognized that in verse 4, he, he wasn't acquitted because he was unaware of sin that he could point out in his life. He didn't have any power to justify himself. Think about the difference between what Paul's saying and, and Pilate, who washes his hands as he sends Jesus off to be crucified. I'm innocent. I'm blameless in this. You take him and do what you will. He's not actually blameless. In that moment, he was arrogantly asserting, asserting his own authority to justify himself. Here, Paul won't take that approach. He recognizes he doesn't have any more power to justify himself than other people have to judge him and justify him. And so always present in his mind is not his own ability to see his sin and declare himself innocent or other people's to do, ability to do that, but it is God. Paul recognized that he saw in part. Uh, you can, um, you have up maybe in uh, point number three, uh, Psalm 19, verse 12, David has to ask God to declare him innocent of hidden fault. That's interesting. Because verse 12 comes after verses 7 through 9 that talks about the searching power of God's word, the perfection of God's word. And Paul, uh, or David rather, in Psalm 19 still recognizes he has faults that are hidden from him. We see in part, we don't see all things that we should. If I see only in part, then I will not trust my own assessment of my heart and life. I'll entrust myself instead to God and let his word examine me thoroughly. That's a, that's a motivator to put to death hypocrisy in us. We don't see the whole picture, so put all that you can see to death. And with that same thing in mind, know that God sees, sees the heart, of, as we've already said. And so our best work, the most energy that we expend, the greatest degree of care that we can muster, and the, as thoroughly as we can possibly pursue purity, all of that should be at the heart level. All of that should be at the heart level. Number four, the fourth thought for crucifying hypocrisy is that man's approval is meaningless. We've already seen that principle in 1 Corinthians 4. For one more passage, just flip over to John chapter 5 to see that man's approval is meaningless. Jesus, in a powerful way, tells the Pharisees this tells the Jews who are searching the scriptures because they think they have some merit in their ability to search scripture. John 5, verse 41, here's what Jesus says. I do not receive glory from men. He doesn't accept it. He says, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves, how does he know this? I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me, is how he knows that. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. And then he adds this, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Notice a few things in these words. Jesus rejected man's glory, man's praises. And as an indictment that these, this crowd to whom he's speaking does not love God, he points out their hypocrisy. The very fact that Jesus came in the Father's name, not taking any glory for himself, only saying the words that the Father gave him to say so that Jesus didn't receive 
his own glory, but that the Father would be glorified. All the miracles he's doing all terminated at the glory of God the Father. And he came to esteem God the Father. And because he came for that reason and only that reason, he's rejected. The Pharisees hate him because the glory of God is coming through everything he's saying, everything he's doing, and they can't tolerate it. But there is another glory that they can tolerate. What is it? They gladly receive people who are self-glorifying. He says again, if another comes in his own name, which Jesus did not do, Jesus did not come in his own name. He came in the name of the Father. And that's why he gets rejected. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Why? Why would they receive people who came and sought to establish their own authority, their glory in their own intellect, in their own abilities? Well, it's because they actually rathered, preferred the glory that came from men rather than the glory that's from the only God. That's what Jesus says in verse 44. They do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. That's the charge. And just notice, as we've been discussing, how he diagnoses that. He diagnoses that as unbelief. He diagnoses this as practical atheism. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive the glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Seeking man's approval is a matter of unbelief. It is a matter of unbelief. It's a refusal to believe God, to esteem God, to submit to his authority, and seek his glory. And so this is the enemy of faith. Faith and seeking man's approval are mutually exclusive. Unbelief is lurking behind every ounce of sinful fear of man, every desire to be glorified by man and esteemed by him. And so to seek man's approval ultimately is really to disown God entirely. To seek man's approval ultimately is to disown God entirely. To fear man, to seek his glory in this way, is really to treat people as if we are from them and through them and for them, as if to them belong the praise and glory forever. Hypocrisy must die wherever man's approval is being sought. If you know that man's approval is meaningless, if we are convinced that man's approval is meaningless, then that helps us to just live in sincerity before God. Because when men approve of the good works that we do, that we're doing to please God, it doesn't matter. So what if people applaud me in the way I parent? So what if people applaud me in the way I love my wife or in the way I submit to my husband, right? For you ladies. So what if people applaud me for sermons delivered or counsel given? So what? I'm not living for their approval. And when I'm doing all of those things to please God and people disapprove, so what? I'm not living for their approval. And so whether men approve or disapprove, I'm always living before God to please him, never the hypocrite. If you're convinced that man's approval is meaningless, then you will put hypocrisy to death. Number five, sincerity requires right motives. Sincerity requires right motives. Let me just give you one passage. Psalm 15, verse 2. Psalm 15, verse 2.
again, as David talks about the person who can permanently remain, permanently dwell, that's a, a forever dwelling in or on God's holy hill, that is Zion. This is the, the same language, just to draw another parallel, in Proverbs 2 that we talked about. I think that was last week. Did I preach last week? Recently, uh, when Solomon says, those with integrity will remain in the land. That's the same word, remain, dwell. Who? Who is it? Verse 2 tells us, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. That's the one who gets to dwell in the, in the land. That's the one who eventually one day will, with all of the saints of old, inherit the kingdom and dwell with God in Zion when he establishes his kingdom. It's the one who walks with integrity, who works righteousness, and speaks truth in his heart. Do you speak the truth in your heart? Or is it enough to just play the part, to convince others? Not speaking the truth in the heart, but just knowing how to give the impression that you're doing that is not enough that will not inherit the kingdom. the one with integrity who will remain in it. And so motives matter. Motives matter. Just, just think about all the reasons you could be motivated to do righteousness. Uh, I like my friends at Grace Bible Church. I don't want the shame of being ostracized or not fitting in here. I like the company um, if I don't do that, maybe I don't get a date if you're single, so I got to fit in. Again, God sees the heart, and so guard your motives. We have right motives when we choose to obey without anything else to sweeten the, the deal. When we're not looking at any other advantages except to God be the glory, then we know that we have upright motives. Number six, little sins damn. Little sins damn. Little sins can condemn us. And I'll just give you one passage, 1 Corinthians 10. This is Paul's point. 1 Corinthians 10. It's the common, perhaps seemingly trivial sins that will eventually condemn us and prove that we do not believe. There are four sins in 1 Corinthians 10 that Paul mentions, and they're all from the Old Testament, from Israel. Israel practiced these common sins, their idolatry, immorality, testing God, and grumbling. Just think about the first and last of those. Idolatry, building a, a, an image and bowing down to it in worship as if it's God, as if it gave you life and is worthy of all worship. And then grumbling, just complaining about the way things are, complaining about the way God is managing his universe. The person in front of you in traffic is driving as slowly as they are ultimately ultimately because God is in control God ordains all things Proverbs 16:33 the lot is cast into the lap its every decision is from Yahweh even the most random occurrences are ultimately overseen, managed, ultimately brought about 
by God's power. Human responsibility plays a part. Man is responsible. We make decisions. We get it. This is God's world. And there is not a single rogue mo molecule that exists in it. So the weather is ordained by God. It was 115 yesterday by God's doing. So don't even complain about the weather. Notice in 1 Corinthians 10, something like grumbling against God is actually a condemnable sin. This is enough to damn. Notice in verse uh, 11, in reference to idolatry, immorality, testing God, and grumbling, Paul says, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, that he does not fall. And then this, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. It's the common to man sins that overtake you, is the point. This is often used as an encouragement. Paul was not encouraging his audience here. He was warning his audience. You know, most often we hear this passage used to say, your temptation, your struggle, don't worry, Lots of people struggle that way. Well, I'm not really sure how that's a comfort if it's the, the very besetting sin that I'm fighting against. Yeah, everybody sins in that way. Should I go, oh, whew. no. Paul's making actually the, the very opposite point. The, the sins that overtake you are the little ones. They're the common ones. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. He hasn't left the conversation about idolatry. Because idolatry is a temptation, because God has given us abundant examples of how just normal people like us succumbed to these awful sins, Beware. You know, it's the little lies, the little compromises, the long standing patterns of living contrary to convictions that end up proving someone to be an unbeliever. So, uproot all of that hypocrisy, cast off all of that sin, and live sincerely, even the little ones get rid of. Number seven, biblical instruction sanctifies and saves. Just, again, you have, have these passages we talked about, First uh, Timothy 1, uh, before. Paul says the goal of our instruction, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's biblical instruction taking aim at the inner life. And then in chapter 4, verse 16, Paul reminds Timothy by paying close attention to himself and his teaching, so his own life and his teaching, who he is and what he says, if he perseveres in these things, he will save, literally save himself and his hearers. So how do you think about biblical teaching? Do you sit under the exposition of God's word as if it's a matter of life and death, you should. You should listen like eternity's on the line. And you should put into practice what you hear, not just being a hearer of the word, but you should pursue being a doer of the word as if your soul is at stake. Because it is. Biblical instruction sanctifies and saves. And those who have been saved by biblical instruction will be sanctified by biblical instruction. Last couple things to note. Eight and nine. Two more thoughts, two final thoughts for crucifying hypocrisy. The day of the Lord is coming. 
the day of the Lord is coming, and finally, the kingdom will be glorious. These are two different sides of the same coin, if you will. The day of the Lord is coming, and first, it is bringing universal destruction on the entire world. The day of the Lord is coming. Wrath is coming first on the day of the Lord. And to follow the wrath and judgment that come is unparalleled blessing. The blessing that follows the wrath to come will be unsurpassed in human history. Both these things are true. This is Zephaniah's point in his prophecy. And he notes how the day of the Lord is coming specifically for hypocrites. People who profess to follow God, profess and swear allegiance to the God of Israel, and yet embrace idols alongside. That's his point in chapter 1, verse 5 of Zephaniah. That this day is coming for those who bow down on the housetop to the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom, an idol, a false god. They are hypocrites. The day of the Lord is coming for them. The destruction is intended for them in particular. And just note that this is for God's people, Israel. People who profess to believe the God of the scriptures. So by implication, the people of God, if you will, people who profess to believe the God of the Bible and yet live in a way contrary to that, maintain duplicitous allegiances, the day of the Lord's coming. Wrath is coming for them. You cannot be a part of the church and yet in your heart maintain other allegiances and think you will escape the wrath to come. It is for you if that is the case. It does not matter that you are regularly amongst God's people. It didn't matter for Israel. It won't matter for the church. And yet we don't want to miss that the kingdom will be glorious. If you are convinced of these two realities, that the day of the Lord is coming and that the kingdom will be glorious, there's hardly any other motivation you need to put off hypocrisy. All the saints listed in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, knew this reality. And that was enough for them to deny themselves in the here and now and live for what could not be seen. They were so convinced that the promises of God coming in the kingdom were worth it that they denied their urges. They denied sin. They put off sinful passion. Moses denied himself the pleasures of Egypt, things that he had ready at his hands, because what was more real to him than those pleasures were the pleasures that were coming. Let me just read one description from Zephaniah 3 of this coming day, this coming kingdom. Chapter 3, verse 12, But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. Notice that is describing sincerity. They're actually humble. They're actually lowly. They actually take refuge in the name of Yahweh. And eventually they will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. They're, they won't be deceitful. For they, for or when they feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. 
In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. This pictures Jesus reigning as king, having triumphed over all his enemies in Zion finally. He will exult over you with joy, the prophet says. He will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Jesus. The picture there is of of him actually bursting forth in melodious notes of joy. Singing, if you will. Jesus sang at the Last Supper. He'll sing again in the kingdom. When he finally gathers his people, and just look at verse 20, at that time I will bring you in, even at that time when I gather you together, indeed I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. There is undreamed of blessing coming to those who live in sincerity, who crucify hypocrisy now. And so since the kingdom will be coming, since that coming kingdom is glorious, then put off hypocrisy now. Live like that day is a reality to you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these realities. Thank you for these truths. I pray for Grace Bible Church that you would help us to put off uh, any deception that remains in us, any insincerity and hypocrisy that remains, even those we see walking in a manner that is not worthy of the gospel, that you would give us courage and compassion to step into their lives and help sanctify uh, one another, not ultimately for our own good, but because you are worthy of that kind of allegiance, you are worthy of that kind of obedience, and so we praise you. We pray that you would get all of the praise, all of the glory that you are due from our very lives. In Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen.